Plug this in. Okay, we're recording. Okay. Okay. So, any questions on the assignment? <laughs> yeah, could you give me a rough estimate for the answer to 5D? 5 what? D, the last one. Because then if I, that's wrong, then I know I've messed up something else. 5D or 5E? Uh, 5D, because E is an answer. Okay. Well, let's just talk about all of number 5. All right. Okay. Well, I can get behind that. <laughs> let's just talk about all of number 5, because I promise you on the test tomorrow, there's going to be a question like this. Okay? I promise you. It's going to happen. So here's the drill. So you've got a cylinder up here. So when it's sitting there, what's the only type of energy that it has? Potential uh, gravity. Oh, right? And you can find that by using MGH. And that's going to be true no matter what happens. This is how much UG that you have. That's it. There is nothing else. Now, what are the two ways that this cylinder can get down to the bottom? It could fall. It could fall, go strike. Or it could roll down. Roll. roll. Okay, those are your two options. It either rolls or it just falls straight down. Now, but here's the ultimate truth, is that you look at this in terms of a chart. And by the way, on tomorrow's test, you're going to have some big complex energy problems. And I'm going to tell you right now, if I don't see the chart, I don't grade the problem. Okay, that's the honest God's truth. I don't see a chart, you don't keep everything organized, I don't grade the problem. I don't care if your answer is right. I'm not going to grade the problem. So I tell you that in the instructions on the test, so I'm just telling you in advance right now. So if you don't like drawing charts, don't even bother to take the test tomorrow because it's going to be a train wreck. Okay? Now, I'm not doing that to be a jerk. I'm doing that because it forces you to keep everything organized. So up at the top, you can figure out how much energy, how much UG that you have. So you can say, okay, I can have some UG, I can have some KT, I can have some KR, and I can have a sum, right? So you can figure out how much this UG uh, gets. You can take mass times sheet times height, you can get this number. So situation number one is going to roll down the hill. So if it rolls down the hill, this amount of UG, uh, right, is going to change into KT, and it's going to change into KR. So here's the trick. If it, this is if it rolls, okay? So if it rolls, UG uh, is going to equal what? The sum of two things, which is going to be? KT and KR. KT and KR, okay? That's what this thing is going to add up to. Now, I'm going to rewrite this on another page so I've got a lot of room. So, I've got UG equaling KT and KR. So this is going to be MGH. Kinetic energy is one half. One half mv squared plus one half i omega squared. Now, here's the problem. This is tough to do, okay? I don't have a moment of inertia scale, okay? They don't exist. I can find mass, I can find radius, I can look up the formula, but I cannot measure directly moment of inertia. Omega is tough to measure as well because that's radians per second, okay? That's tough to measure. Meters per second, hey, I can take a little radar gun and I can figure out how fast the ball was going, okay? This is tough to measure directly, so we're going to get clever. So we're going to come in here, we're going to leave this as one-half mv squared. Now, because it's a solid cylinder, how do you calculate the moment of inertia of a solid cylinder? One-half one mr squared, don't memorize that, but this is a common one, okay? Now, keep in mind, this one-half is not this one-half. This one half only exists because it's a solid cylinder. Okay? Don't go, oh, this is the same one half. It's not. Completely different. Okay? Now, for omega, you know that linear velocity equals r omega. Okay, hey, that's kind of cool. So I can substitute this, square that, and I get v squared over r squared. So this is the most critical step that you have to do in this process is this step right here. Because what's going to happen is that that's going to cancel out your R's, and then you're going to have one-half mv squared plus one-half, excuse me, one-fourth mv squared. 
equals MGH. So right away, what can you get rid of? Max. All goes away. Okay. And then this becomes three fourths. And here's the deal. Now, for the test tomorrow, don't sit here and memorize this equation and go, oh, it's a solid cylinder. Oh, GH equals, you know, three fourths uh, V squared, and then V equals the square root of four thirds GH. Do not memorize this. What you, what you have to understand, and this is true especially of this test for tomorrow. If you go through and you memorize random small bits of information, tomorrow's test is going to be a train wreck. You have to look at these problems in their entirety, okay? Don't sit there and memorize steps. Look at the big picture, okay? That's what you have to look at. So, once you get this, then you can figure out the fact that, wow, this only depends upon the height, okay? Change the height, boom, I don't need the mass, I don't need the radius. The only thing I need to know is how high this thing is, and I calculate the linear velocity from there. So, if all goes well on 5b, that answer should be around 2.5 meters per second. Okay? Yeah. Now, and on C, your radians per second should be around 50. Okay? That's an ish, but it should be around 50. Now, on D, here's the deal what's going to happen on D. And again, this is where you look at the big picture. On D, if you go back to this idea, instead of splitting it into rotational and kinetic energy, we're just going to let this thing fall. So there won't be any rotational kinetic energy. So that means all of that UG gets transferred into all kinetic. Okay? Right? It all goes into kinetic. So what that means is that then you can go, oh, that MGH equals one half MV squared. So your answer to 5D should be a little bit above 3 meters per second, which should be faster than the first one because of the fact that you're not splitting this energy into rotational and kinetic energy. It's all pure kinetic energy. That's why that velocity is faster. Okay? Promise you that it's going to be one like number five. Okay? And don't just memorize it. Okay? Understand the process. Okay? Understand the process. Okay. Let's talk about number four. With the satellite. I promise you there's going to be a satellite problem on the test. Okay, maybe not this complex, but there's going to be a satellite problem on you. And again, you have to look at this problem in a big picture kind of sense. So here's this satellite, right? And we're going to give it a boost up into some orbit, right? So imagine that this wheel is the satellite and, and the projector is the sun. So if this thing isn't spinning, you're going to have one side of the satellite getting really, really hot, and you're going to have the other side of the satellite getting really, really cold. Okay? But you obviously can't have this thing spinning when it's in the space shuttle. Okay? You, you boost it out, and then you fire the engines, and you make them spin. So you've got to go from rest to some amount of rotation. Now, you don't want this thing spinning so fast that, you know, it's like, oh, warp speed, okay? It creates its own problem, okay? If you look... You're, you're, you're not spinning all of that fast, okay? You're spinning in about 32, what is it, 32 revolutions per minute, whatever it is, okay? So you're not spinning warp speed, okay? You're, it's, it's pretty slow rotation, and you have five minutes to do this. So it's not going to be a very big acceleration. So your answer to 4A should be 0 0.01 and then some change, okay? Because if that's wrong, literally everything else is going to be wrong on this problem. Okay? So that should be 0 0.01 and then some, something after that. Okay? But that should at least get you into the ballpark. You're going to take the revolutions per minute, change that into radians per second, use that as your butt, and then find your fish from there. Now, on B, you want to find the force. On B, can you use F equals MA? No. No! Why not? Leslie? Because it's spinning. Okay? Anytime you make something spin, you can't use F equals MA. But what you can use 
is the idea that torque equals force times radius, which equals I alpha. Okay? Now, are you going to use MR squared for I? No. No. It's a solid why? cylinder. It's a cylinder. Okay? So you're going to find I, you know alpha, you know the radius, find the force. Now, that's the total amount of force needed. But you have four rockets to make this happen. Okay? So if all goes well, that answer to 4B uh, should be around the legal drinking age. Okay? Not, when it, not what you think it is when mom and dad are out of town. Okay, now, on C. So C is one of the most critical calculations if you're an engineer. Because someone comes to you and says, hey, you know, we've got to figure out how much fuel to take. Well, you don't want to overestimate the amount of fuel because kilograms cost money to get into space. Okay, you don't go, oh, play it on the safe side. We'll, talk, we'll take along like 1,000 kilograms of fuel. It's like, it's like, how'd you get in 1,000? I don't know. It just seems like a good number. Well, here's the deal. Per kilogram into space is about $100,000, okay? So they don't, you don't want to have to carry any more fuel than you have to because it costs money. Now, the other side is you don't want to carry, you don't want to run out of fuel before it gets spinning fast enough, and then you're going, okay, we just lost, a, we just launched a $50 million satellite, and it's not spinning fast enough, and we're going to fry the electronics because you can't do a simple physics calculation. At that point, you're fired. So, here's the idea. Rockets work by expelling fuel at a very high velocity. So on that one, you're going to go force time equals change in momentum equals mass times change in velocity. Change in mass times velocity. So in this case, we're keeping the velocity the same and we're changing the mass. You know how much force it takes per rocket, you know how much time they have to fire, and you know the velocity of the escaping gas. So that answer to 4C should be around the mid-teens, okay, for mass, somewhere around the mid-teens. Uh, now on D, you want to find that rotational kinetic energy. Uh, that should be something times 10 to the fifth. And then E, you want to find the work done. Now, here's the deal with work, okay? Work, work can take on a whole bunch of different aspects. If you're talking about linear work, the basic definition is that it's force times distance. Now, this is what you have to think through. You have two situations with work in terms of motion. You can have constant velocity work where I'm applying a force over a distance to keep this thing moving. Okay? So one option is this just force times distance. Right? Simple. If you draw a graph, here's your force, here's your distance, you find that area underneath, you get the work that's done. Okay? So that's one option is that work can be done and maintain constant velocity. The other side is that, that work can be done and change your amount of energy. Okay? So if I take that same one kilogram mass and I lift it up, I'm doing work, but I'm storing potential energy. Or if I take that one kilogram mass and I catch it and I change the kinetic energy, I'm doing work. Okay? So there's two aspects of work that you have to keep straight. One is you don't change any energy, but you're just using it to keep it going. The other side is that where you do change the amount of energy, which is going to be force times distance, you hit the brakes on your car while wow. you're changing the kinetic energy. You hit the gas pedal on your car. You're increasing the kinetic energy. Okay? So there's two aspects of work that you need to keep straight. Okay? You need to keep that part of that straight. Now, if you're talking about rotational work, well, work also equals change in your rotational energy, and that's just a one-trick pony. That's just KR. Okay, that's it. That's all you can do with it. So that's going to equal torque theta. Now, this is where this gets a little bit weird in terms of the units. Now, remember, torque is Newton meters. That's just radians. Don't have to worry about that. 
So here you have newton meters, which is going to get you joules. Okay? So in this situation, if you think about it, this, this, this equation makes sense. Because if I apply a torque through just a small number of radians, I don't do much work. I don't change the kinetic energy of this wheel very much. But if I apply a big torque over a large number of radians, I'm going to do more work. I'm going to change the kinetic energy of the wheel quite a bit. So the bigger the torque and the greater the degrees through which that works, the more work that you're going to do, the more of the kinetic energy that thing is going to change. So the same thing is true if I stop it. I can apply a small force over a large number of radians to make it slow down, or I can apply a large force over a short distance to make it stop. Okay? But no matter what, I'm doing work because I'm changing that rotational kinetic energy. So, uh, anyway, so on F, on 4, that answer should be 130-ish. Okay, that's an ish, but it should be somewhere around there. Uh, G, you have to find the orbital velocity of the satellite using big G M over R. Uh, and that answer on 4G should be something times 10 to the 11th. Everybody cool with that? Okay. Uh, on the pendulum problem, which you're very likely to see a pendulum problem on this as well, uh, because if, four, if 2C is wrong, everything is wrong. So your answer to 2C should be 4 and then a little something more, okay? Like just a little bit above 4 meters per second. Because literally, if that's wrong, everything is going to be wrong, okay? So your answer to that should be around 4. Uh, and then your angle on G that it's going to swing up to should be in the mid-40s. Okay. And on number three, because that all kind of builds off of each other. So on 3C, if that goes well, this is an ish, but it should be around 40. Bonda? <laughs> Okay. Now, if you want to hold on to this assignment and hand it in tomorrow, that's cool. If you're done with it and you want to hand it in, that's cool too. Okay, whatever works. For you. Okay. Anything else? Once, twice, so. Okay. We got to read number two. So, Garrett, stop that for a second. Okay, we go. Landon, have you got, got the approval? Yeah. I feel, it feels like you're like a kind of a supervisory role. Yeah. So I'm just so watching, making sure that everything's cool. It's good. Yeah. Okay, how many, how many honor physics students does it take to the <laughs> camera? Three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, this problem that we're going to work, number one, it's nice because it ties together a whole bunch of different things. Okay. Also, uh, you're very, 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 very likely to see a problem like this on the test. So let's just make sure everybody knows what's going on. So here's the basic setup. Is that it's almost impossible to directly measure the speed of like a high-speed bullet. Okay, so it isn't like, oh, Shively, we're going to have Shively go out and run down the hall when we can figure out where he's at, where he's not, and how far he's going to run, and how much time that takes. Okay, if you had a bullet traveling close to the speed of sound, that's tough to measure that velocity. So what they do is use what's called a ballistic pendulum. So this ballistic pendulum is typically made out of pipe. And in this sample, we're going to let that have a mass of 4.00 kilograms. So this has what's in it called a ballistics gel. So the bullet comes in, it hits this, and then this whole thing will swing up here. Okay, so this is what's called a ballistic pendulum. So it's just, so what I'm going to do to kind of model that, I'm going to shoot plastic marble into the high-tech ballistic pendulum, otherwise known as a toilet roll dispenser, and it should hit within this, and then it's going to swing up something like this. So what you do is you actually record this with like a high-speed camera, and you see how high this thing swings up after the collision. Now, let's look at the big picture, okay? So... 
I've got to pull this spring back. So when I pull that back, what am I doing? Storing ups, right? Now, how do you calculate ups? One half kx squared. Now, here's what. Here's a couple of things I want to point out about springs. Okay. So you all just said incorrectly that delta us equals one half kx squared. Okay. And that's true. It's a spot on equation. Here we go. But let's look at. Let's step one step back. If I ask you to draw a graph of force and elongation from the compression of that spring, okay? I'm going to draw a graph, force and elong and compression of the spring. What would that graph look like? Evelyn, would that graph start at zero, zero? Yes, you say that with absolutely no confidence. Why? Your answer is right. Why? Why is it right? <coughs> well, how much is that spring going to compress if I don't apply the force to it? Not at all. Not at all. Why? Mother Nature was lazy. Mother Nature goes, you want the spring to compress? You do it. Screw you. Okay? I'm not touching it. I'm lazy. You want to compress? Fine. You do the work. So, we're going to start at zero, zero. That's why. No force, no elon, no compression. Right? So here's the question. You have four options. It could be linear going up like this. It could be a quadratic going up like this. It, it could be a linear going down like this, or it could be a quadratic going down like this. You have four options. Felix. Linear going up. Beautiful. Why? down so the distance or the elongation will get larger to the force applied as you pull it. Beautiful. Okay. This is a, this is called it's a, it's a Hooke's law relationship. F equals kx. Right? So this is the slope of your line. The more the more you want to compress, the more force that it's going to take. Right? Okay. Cool. Now so when I get to this point, and here's what I want you to look at. If I said, how much work did I do? Here's what I want you to avoid, okay? Some of you are saying, oh, the work that I'm going to do is just force times distance, okay? And you're, and you're just taking this force and you're multiplying it by that compression. That won't work in this situation because here's the reason why. You're treating this as like a rectangle, okay? In other words, you're saying I'm applying the same force over the entire distance. And I'm not. That if to use this, this would be like if I take this one kilogram mass and I push it across my hand with a constant force. Okay? I'm applying the same force over the entire distance. So I can't use force times distance on any type of spring because it isn't a rectangle. You're saying, oh, this thing is going to be a rectangle and I'm going to find the area of a rectangle. It's not what we're saying. This is actually a triangle. So this area here, this, it isn't just force times distance. It is, but this actual area here is one half force times that elongation. Okay? That's the whole key to this. So work, I'm not saying work doesn't equal force times distance. It does. But in this situation, this area is going to be a triangle and it isn't going to be a rectangle. Okay. Now. Because of that, what Felix said, this is Hooke's law, you have f equals kx, it's a linear relationship, here's your slope, here's your y value, here's your x value. Now, when I do this, if I take this area, and again, this is when you want to set up a chart. I go, okay, I did some amount of work, right? And that work becomes us, okay? Because if I know how far I compressed it, I know how much work that I did. Now, if I let go of that spring, okay, if I go doink, what's immediately gonna what's that spring immediately gonna do? Invert the potential into kinetic. Gonna go from potential energy into kinetic energy. It's gonna make that ball of launch. Mother nature hates potential energy. 
Okay, it isn't like I flip this down and Mother Nature goes, I don't know. Maybe it's changed. Maybe, you know, I don't know. Okay, I'll go ahead and make it go down. No, immediately, as soon as I flip that down, it's going to change into, into kinetic energy. So what I could do is say, okay, with that kinetic energy, then it's going to be the same thing. So whatever I work I do is whatever us I have, which is whatever kinetic energy that I have. So that's going to be the kinetic energy of the ball. So if I wanted to, I could set like 1 half kx squared equal to that amount of kinetic energy, which is 1 half mv squared. Okay, so if I know this amount of potential energy in the spring is changing purely into kinetic energy, wow, I could just set those two things equal. But here's the bigger truth. Set up this chart, okay? Because what I might say is, oh, okay, well, what's going to happen when that spring is only like halfway compressed? How much potential energy is there then? Then it's going to be split between the two. So you can only set these equal if one has gone to zero and it's all into that other form. And again, don't sit there and memorize this process. You have to understand this bigger idea that energy is being conserved within a system. Okay, that's the bigger idea. Set up a chart. Okay, so I'm going to flip this down. It's going to come out. Boom, marble's going to get launched. In theory, what should happen is that because I've got a tissue stuck in here, it should hit this and it should like swing up. Okay, in theory, that's what should happen. We'll try it. They don't let me have a rifle and ballistics gel in school. Shh. I know. Bummer. Okay. Yeah, what's funny is that when I was in high school, literally, guys would show up at school and shotguns in the back windows of their trucks. Because they'd leave from school, they'd go hunting, and nobody thought anything of it. You do that now, you're going to get arrested. Okay. Ooh, that one actually worked. So, it hit, and it went up here, and it swung up here. So we took that amount of energy that it had, right? And then it stored it as potential energy up here. So here's what I want to look at with this ballistic pendulum. Let me go back to this one. So I got this thing here, it's going to swing up. So here's what I want to look at, torque. When this thing is all the way up at the top of that swing, what's the only type of energy that it has? Potential, which I want to use by calculating what? MGH. MGH. So up here at the top, I have all of, which Tori tells me, and so correctly, that it's MGH. Okay? I've got that number. I know how high it swings, I know what G is, and I can figure out the mass. Okay? Now, but what, here's, but here, again, here's the bigger picture. What created that ability for that thing to swing up there? Something had to happen. What did it have to have down here? It had to have potential energy, right? Now, did it have to have potential energy or did it have to have kinetic energy? It had to have kinetic, okay? It has no potential energy because it's just sitting down here. Nothing's going to happen. So I look at this in the context of it swinging up from that equilibrium position. So, this has to have some amount of kinetic energy. So what do you think the relationship is between the kinetic energy that it has here and the potential energy that it has at the very top of the swing? Same. It's the same, because the energy has to be conserved. Ah, right. So that has to equal that kinetic energy. So I'm going to come over here and go, okay. The kinetic energy at the bottom has to equal UG at the top. Because However much energy this has is two joules, whatever it is. That's how much connect. That's how much potential energy I can store at the top. That's it. I can't create any more. So this is going to be one half mv squared, and like Tori said, that's going to be mgh. Now, here's the deal. Okay, here's the deal. What mass is this? Okay, is this? The four kilograms of the pendulum, is it the 18 grams of the bullet, or is it the combined mass? Landon. Mm, combined. 
Yeah, because the bullet is stuck in it, right? And it swings up like this. So this is going to be the combined mass, okay? Now, is this mass here the bullet, the four kilograms, or the combined mass? Chively. Bullet. Oh. Okay. What if the bullet never hits the pendulum? Is this thing going to swing up? So what allows this pendulum to even have kinetic energy? The bullet. The hitting it, right? Because yeah. if the bullet doesn't hit it, it doesn't have any energy at all. So, Shively, let's revisit the question. Is that the mass of the bullet, the combined mass, or the mass of the pendulum? Combined mass. That's the combined mass, because it doesn't have any kinetic energy until the bullet becomes part of the system. Okay? Now, here's the deal. Since these masses, and only because these masses are the same, what can I do here? Cancel. Cancel, Cancel them out. So then, if I simplify this, I get V equals the square root of 2GH. So that tells me how fast this thing had to be moving here to swing up to this height. Now, I want you to think about something. So this thing is going to swing up to a height of 12 centimeters. So if I took this same bullet and had a certain amount of kinetic energy, would, would that give me to the same height if I just shot it straight up with that same amount of kinetic energy? In other words, if I made a swing on a pendulum, it goes up to 12 centimeters. If I shot it straight up with the exact same amount of kinetic energy, would it still go to a height of 12 centimeters? Honus. Yeah. Yes, why? Because you're conserving energy. Yeah. No matter what if I only have a certain number of joules of energy, how I get to the point where it's all ugh doesn't make any difference. It's all going to be ugh. So if I shoot it straight up without amount of energy, or I make it swing, doesn't make any difference. It's all going from kinetic, and it's all going into UG. Okay? Now, we'll, we'll, we'll test our mathematical calculations without Mary here. Okay? So the room mom isn't here, but we'll see how we get along. Okay? The calculator room mom. So we got 2G times uh, 12 centimeters, which is going to be 0 0.120 meters. Go multiply and tell me that's 1,200. That's like the height of an orbiting satellite. So, what do you get? I'm getting like 1.53. Mm -hmm. Evelyn, are we good at 1.53? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Evelyn's taking the role of Mary. Okay. Do we need another addition precision since there's four in the centimeters? No, nah, it's okay. Okay. It's close now, here's the deal. So, do you think this is the velocity of the bullet? No. No. I'm old, I don't have a gallbladder, and I can run faster than this, okay? This is not the velocity of the bullet, okay? If it is, I can outrun it. It's like, go ahead, shoot me. I'll outrun it. Go ahead. Okay? But, here's the question. Can I use this number to get the velocity of the bullet? Yeah. Because yes. here's the deal. You've got to work this in two stages. The first part, you work it from an energy perspective. The second part, what do you think you're going to use? What are the two, what's one, th what is, what th what one thing is always conserved in a collision, no matter what? Momentum. So the first thing we're going to do is work it from an energy perspective. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to work it from, from a momentum standpoint. So, Prior to this, what's the only type of inter what's the only type what's the only thing that had any momentum at all? The bullet. The bullet. Then this thing is going to have a certain amount of momentum. So step one is energy. Step two is momentum. So then we're going to go, okay. Momentum of the bullet plus the momentum of the pendulum equals the new momentum of the bullet plus the new momentum of the pendulum. So what was the initial momentum of the pendulum? Zero. Goose it, right? We don't have to worry about this. So this is going to be the mass of the bullet, velocity of the bullet. Now, because it's embedded, what can I do over there? You can combine the mass. So this is the mass of the bullet 
plus the mass of the pendulum times V prime. So what does the 1.53 represent? V prime. That's the, that's the new velocity in the system after it moves off together. Okay? That's not the velocity of the pulley. So now that we've got this, then we can sit here and go, all right, I got all these numbers except for the velocity of the bullet. So I'm going to divide both sides by the mass of the bullet. Okay, mass of the bullet. That goes away. Now, can I just cancel out the masses of the bullets? No. Parentheses. Yeah, because it's added together, not multiplied together. So, in this case, I got 0 0.018 kilograms plus 4.00 kilograms. What was that velocity? 1.53? Yeah. yeah. And then divided by 4.018 kilograms. So what do you get? Okay. No, no, no. That's bad. Hold on. That's just the mass of the Lord. That's 0 0.018. Not that, that's not the combined mass. Totally wrong. Uh, 341. What'd you get? All right, 342 meters per second. Now, does that seem reasonable? Yeah. Okay. It's a little bit faster than the speed of sound. Huh? Okay. Now, here's the question. Could this be a perfectly elastic collision? Mr. Marshall, you shake your head to know why. It's a California problem. You said that can't be a perfectly elastic. Okay? Because, number one, let's talk about perfectly elastic collisions. If you need those specific formulas to calculate the new velocity of the bullet, the new velocity of the target, I will give you those equations on the test. Okay? Don't memorize them. If you need them, I will give them to you. But here's the bigger picture. If something is a perfectly elastic collision, what is conserved? Energy. Energy. And momentum. And momentum. Okay? So, number one, even if you look at the formulas, you have different, you, the whole point is that you find a new velocity of the bullet and the new velocity of the target. Right? Okay? So, by virtue of the fact that you're finding two new velocities and this thing is moving off together, it says, eh, that might not be so cool in terms of a situation where they're going to move off together because they're going to have the same velocity, but yet the formula gives us two different velocities, so that kind of seems a little bit weird. Now, here's what I want to look at. I, what I want to do is I want to calculate the initial kinetic energy of the bullet, and then I want to compare that to the, kinetic, to the potential kinetic energy of the ballistic pendulum and the bullet when it's at the top of the swing. Okay? And we'll see if this thing is, is perfectly elastic. That, that's the true test. Okay, we'll just compare the energy. So, here's the deal. So I'm going to take that bullet, which has a velocity of 340, what was it, 342? So this is going to be one half mass of 0 0.018 kilograms times 342 meters per second squared. So somebody squared 342 and then multiply that by half of 0 0.018. Yeah. 1,050? 1,050. 1,050 joules. Okay? Now, uh, no. okay? That's a lot of joules. Okay? Okay, that's 1,050. Is it possible for an elephant to have that same amount of kinetic energy? Yes. Yeah, yeah, but the elephant would have to be going really fast. Slow, 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 really slow, slow right? Because yeah. the elephant's going to have more mass. So it's possible for a bullet and an elephant to have the same momentum and the same energy because of the fact that they're both dependent upon mass and velocity. So that's how much kinetic energy the bullet brought in. Now, let's figure out how much UG we stored at the top when that pendulum swung up here. So that's going to be MGH. My smart board is being stupid today. So that's going to be 
That mass, which is... Would it be 4.018? Oh, let me read Because it's right. the combined? What? Would it be 4.018 since yeah. it's the combined? Yep, 4.018 kilograms times G times, what is the height, 12 centimeters? Yeah. Uh, 0. 0.12. 1, 2, hate you. Okay. So what do you get? 4.73. Yeah. Yeah. 4.73, right? It's close to the same amount of energy. Oh, yeah. They're pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the deal. This is how much energy this brought in, 1,050. We only ended up with 4.73 joules. So where did the rest of that energy go? Bye-bye. When you go and bye-bye, okay, it can't just disappear. It went into stopping the bullet. It went to, a lot of it's going to go into energy, okay, into thermal energy. So if you've ever seen like, where you have like a bullet going into a ballistic pendulum or actually hitting flush, Here's what annoys me about Hollywood and video games and whatever, is that they make it sound like, oh, you get hit with a bullet, you have this small little wound, and the next day, oh, you're back. Okay, maybe your arm's in a sling, whatever. You get hit with a high-speed bullet with this much kinetic energy, that energy has to go somewhere, okay? That energy is going, is going to go into destroying muscles, tendons, blood vessels, bone, okay? That is a tremendous amount of energy that this thing is bringing into the system. And it has to go somewhere. Okay? It has to go somewhere. So if you look at, in reality, what happens when things get hit with bullets, this is, from a physics perspective, video games are horrible. Because to make it sound like, oh, it's not a big deal. Hey, you know, you get hit. What's the big deal? This is a tremendous energy, it, it, and it has to go somewhere, and it's going to go into transferring it into the kinetic energy and tearing muscles and blood vessels and shattering bones. You, you're never the same, trust me, when you get hit with this much energy. So that energy goes into deforming something, the ballistic gel, a human body, whatever that is. So that's what annoys me about how Hollywood portrays bullets. Like, oh, it's not a big deal. Oh, it is. That is a tremendous amount of energy that has to go somewhere. Now, if this had been a purely elastic collision, this thing would end up with 1,050 joules of potential energy. That means this thing would have gone really, 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 really high because of the fact that if all of that energy went into it, that's how much energy that you would have afterwards. Okay? But it didn't because we lost so much energy in that collision. Got that. Promise you, promise you, promise you, promise you, promise you. There's going to be a ballistic problem on the test tomorrow. There's one on the review. Here's the sequence. You work it from an energy perspective first. Okay? You figure out how fast this system was going to swing up. So here's the sequence. Do energy first. Momentum second. Okay, so it's kind of like the alphabet. E before M. Do energy first, momentum second. So UG equal to KT, figure out how fast the pendulum is going, use that value to calculate momentum. Because here's the deal I can't do momentum first. Why couldn't I do, why couldn't, you, why couldn't I even try to work the momentum problem first? You don't have a velocity prime. Yeah, I don't know how fast the bullet's going. Or do I know V prime? I can't do momentum if I try, because I have two unknown variables. Okay? That's why you have to work energy first. That allows you to get this one, then you can roll with that on momentum. Okay? Cool with that. Okay. Let's see if this pin has enough charge on it. Okay. Uh, oh. So let's say, let's just say. I'm going to have four different situations. Three different. We're going to have a block, and I'm just going to let it fall a certain height. Situation number two, I'm going to have the exact same height. 
but I let the block slide down. And then situation number three, we're at the exact same height, but I'm going to have a really, really long ramp. Okay? So, in all three situations, the block is the same height above the ground. Okay? And so, the mass is the same, and age is the same in all three situations. So, what do all three have in common? The same potential the same energy. energy. That the same up, right? So here's the million dollar question, okay? They all have the same up. So here's what I want to know. One's going to drop, and these are all the magic frictionless surfaces. This is going to be important. These are all the magic frictionless surfaces. So we're not losing any energy to burn. Which one of those three is going to take the longest to hit the ground? The first one, the second one, the third one, or are they all going to take the same amount of time? They're going to take longer. They're all going to take the same. Okay, so how many vote? They're all going to take the same amount of time. One, two, okay. How about one's going to take the longest? This one, the top one. Second one? Third one. Shiva, why did you vote for the third one? I mean, it's going a longer distance. Yeah, so? I mean, they'll end up with the same velocity, but like, it'll take more time to build it. Three. You have anything to add to Shively's argument? No. Oh. Felix, you good with that argument? I think so. Okay. So, there was two parts of what you said. Okay, let's talk about the time part of it. Okay. What if I ask you this? Which one would have the largest acceleration? Madeline, of those three, which object is going to have the largest acceleration? Block one, block two, block three, or or all the acceleration is going to be the same? The acceleration is going to be the same. So what's the, what's the value of that acceleration going to be? Negative 9.8 so all three of these are going to have the exact same acceleration. No. 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 Garrett, you shake your head no. Why? Because there's other uh, forces acting on. Okay. Yeah. So which of those three, Garrett, do you think is going to have the smallest acceleration? The one on the very bottom. Which one do you think is going to have the biggest acceleration? The one up top. Okay. Now, do you all remember this little equation? That acceleration equals g sine theta? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, do you all remember that? Okay, it deals with force parallel. Okay, so if there's no friction at all, this is how you calculate the acceleration on an inclined plane. But here's the bigger point. I'm going to figure out, we're going to figure out why you're right. So when this thing is falling, it's only that component of gravity that's acting along the surface is what's making it speed up. This has the smallest angle, so this is going to have the smallest acceleration. So not only does it have the smallest acceleration, it also has the greatest distance to travel. That one has the biggest acceleration, and it has the shortest distance to travel. So the first one, that time is going to be a lot shorter than this one does. Because if, that, if, if you're right, then you could say, hey, you know, you have two people standing on top of a mountain and you're all going snow skiing, okay? If that's the case, one person, you're, if, if you're all right that it's the same time, then the person that just jumps off the base yeah. of the cliff is going to land at the exact same time as the person that goes snow skiing down the hill, okay? Huh? <laughs> efficiency right there. It's efficiency, there you go. So this is going to take the longest amount of time. Now, Shively, what else? You said something else that was very important. They'll have the same velocity at the end. Why are they going to have the same velocity at the end? Because they all have to have the same kinetic energy. Why? Because they all have the same. Okay. okay. So, because, and this is going to be important, because I dropped them, okay, because I dropped them, I didn't push them, I dropped them. Okay, this is going to be important. I dropped them. 
So how much kinetic energy did either did any of them have at the beginning? Zero. Zero. So you only have UG at the top, so guess what? You only have kinetic energy at the bottom. So all three of them are going to have the same speed when they hit. This is going to take a lot longer, but this is going to land, this is going to hit with the exact same velocity as the one that's, that's just dropped. Now, what if, I, what if I took this one and I pushed it down? Then what would I add to it? Kinetic. Then I would have kinetic energy and potential, potential energy. So if I push this one down, this would land with a greater speed because of the fact that it has potential and kinetic energy, whereas the other ones just have UG up at the top. Okay? So keep that in mind when you're thinking about things. Uh, in terms of big problems, okay? You know you're going to have one where you're going to have like a spring and it's going to get launched and it's going to turn into potential energy, kinetic energy, that type of thing, okay? I beg of you set up a chart. But there's going to be one with a cylinder, okay, with a satellite being launched, okay? It won't be as complex as this one, but you need to understand that concept, okay? Uh, there's likely to be one involving a pendulum, okay? where you have potential energy changing that kinetic energy. Uh, those are going to be the big problems that are going to be on the test. Now, for the review, there's actually two parts to the review that's back there. You have a blank review for, uh, that's kind of like this, a simpler version, and that one has like the ballistic pendulum problem on it. And then you have another one, which is more, the more complex problems, which is like the satellite, the pendulum, that type of thing you have the answer keys to both of those. So if you haven't picked up those answer keys, I suggest you do that. Uh, you've got your stuff back, go through, work through all of that. Most of the test is going to be multiple choice, but there is going to be uh, some big complex problems that you have to work out. And I beg of you, I beg of you, I beg of you, draw the charts, okay? Draw the energy charts. So. I am done. So if you haven't picked up the reviews, the reviews are back there. Call it